Roman once said that the demonic spirit's art had inhabited Kevin's mind from the day he cut his hand off, and he told Kevin to drag it out. Right now, the ghosts of the demonic spirit's art are whispering to Kevin to kill Benson, trying to come out, making Kevin struggle to control himself. Out of nowhere, the spirit tells him Benson will swing his sword from top to bottom. Believing this ability, he narrowly avoids his opponent's attack. Benson's sword passes right in front of his eyes. In a situation where he could die due to the slightest carelessness, Kevin feels alive even when the voices still overwhelm him. Deep down, he wants to be more beneficial to Roman. He wants to be more powerful than Chris, who's chosen as the second commander. Just then, that much emotion finally brings out the demonic spirit's arts to the surface. A crimson red light shines from Kevin's sword while consuming a bit of mana. He can use it only for a fleeting time, but Kevin has enough power to cut down steel during that time. He doesn't hesitate when he charges forward. Benson is stunned as he sees Kevin's sword is going to pierce through his armor. His expression turns to one that shows how scared he is, and he hurries to swing his sword toward Kevin to get a chance to live. However, contrary to what any average human would do, Kevin does not avoid it. He keeps moving forward, and his expression turns even more ferocious. Instantly, he cries after realizing his mistake for underestimating and making a joke about Kevin. He tries to get away, but Kevin's attacks prove to be so strong that the sword goes through Benson's chest, surprising Chris and everyone watching their fight. Kevin gets on top of the collapsed Benson. He grabs his sword then stabs and slashes toward his opponent ferociously, not even giving him the chance to stand up. Each time Kevin's sword pulled out of his body, blood splattered everywhere around them, giving reign of horror to the audience that watched them. Benson's condition is so horrible that no one can even call him human anymore. And obviously, Kevin takes the win in this final battle as well. He stands up laughing, then walks as if he hasn't suffered any wounds. After walking for quite a while, Kevin arrives and kneels in front of Roman. As Roman looks down at him, Kevin's expression changes like a child wanting to be praised. Kevin announces his return, and Roman praises him for his excellent work. And hearing these words, Kevin feels like he has won over the world. The fight is over now. The battle between Barco and Lawrence has finally come to an end. Everyone assumes Barco will win, but the results they see today are good enough to shake the entire Cairo kingdom. Three wins out of three battles, it's Lawrence's win. And the one at the center of it is unmistakably Roman Dimitri. The rumors spread incredibly fast. When people from the northeast region of the kingdom get together, they naturally gossip about what happens in Lawrence. They recount the pivotal moment when Roman emerges as Lawrence's unforeseen savior. In a dire situation where the city's defenses teeter on the brink of collapse, Roman launches a fearless assault on the Barco forces, leaving a trail of their soldiers in his wake. Moreover, he shatters the flare device, single-handedly altering the course of the siege. Without Roman's intervention, the invaders from Barco might have claimed Lawrence as their own by now. Rumors are always a mixture of truth and a bit of fiction, just like a heroic tale passed down from generation to generation. Like those two people are talking, many people in the Northeast region praise Roman's achievements. Roman's actions are so great that they are impressive to everyone. The rumors have spread so widely that one can see the children praying Roman's heroism on the streets. Meanwhile, Viscount Barco, who returns to the castle after suffering defeat in battle with Lawrence, looks like someone who has drowned in a pool of despair. Papers are piled up on his desk. Their content is already explicit to him. The Golden Bank must be asking how he will repay the principal amount in the future after his defeat in this territorial war. Also, the Cairo Mercenary Guild is angry about the death of Homrosos and wants him to pay the penalty. Once the war was over, none of the nobles, who were earlier friendly and greeted him with a warm smile every time they met, answered his calls. The burden of defeat weighs down his shoulders. It's unsettling. He is in a situation where he cannot think of how to pay his debt off or recover from the defeat. It's because he is sure of his victory. If only Roman hadn't come in and shattered his plan, Barco would be enjoying his victory. That makes Viscount Barco think. His family has been driven to the edge of destruction. He jumps up from his seat, grinning and scheming something to deal with Roman. A few days later, Viscount Barco gathers all the nobles on his side to discuss his plan. The leader of this pack, Viscount Barco stands tall and thanks them for joining him in the meeting. However, none of the nobles attending the meeting like the compliments from Viscount Barco. They are all here because they know their relationship with Dimitri isn't good despite knowing how dangerous this move is. Viscount Barco wastes no time and gets straight to the point. He understands that a fair cause is essential in the intricate world of noble conflicts. Barco's actions are rooted in the honorable pursuit of reclaiming a debt owed by their ancestors. This cause has garnered the recognition of the central government. Yet, the tale takes a twist when Roman, driven by unclear motivations and lacking in fair cause, thrusts himself into the conflict. His surprise offensive catches Barco off guard, resulting in the loss of their battle. To add to the turmoil, the fighters of Lawrence are all Roman soldiers. His voice rises, demanding sympathy from those around him. 
The question lingers in the air of why Roman, seemingly disconnected from the Lawrence family, steps in to aid them. The Lawrence family has publicly severed ties with Dimitri by canceling their marriage. The logic of his support still needs to be discovered. Why Count Barco convinces everyone of his argument when they agree with him. His statement is true and Roman's intervention without cause deserves punishment. Thus, this is an issue that has to be discussed publicly. This is his only chance to hold Roman accountable for his actions and demand massive compensation from his family instead. For Barco, the Golden Bank is the most urgent matter now. They will not hesitate to crush the Barco family if he can't pay the debt. Suddenly, the conference room's door is slammed open and Roman barges inside, proudly smiling to learn that he can crush all opposing nobles at once. Viscount Barco is confused to see him voluntarily step into a place in which everyone wants him dead. Roman then speaks if any of them have complaints about him, they should say it directly to his face. The day before, Krish panics after learning that Roman intends to venture into Barco's territory. After all, Roman had disrupted Barco's schemes, so the idea of him voluntarily walking into their domain seemed utterly absurd. However, Roman, undeterred by Chris's apprehension, had posed the question of how his relationship with Barco is right now. Chris had hesitated before responding, and then he said Barco undoubtedly views Roman as their sworn enemy at this point, so it would be wiser to keep their distance. But Roman had a different perspective. He firmly rejected Chris's suggestion, recalling a fundamental principle he had established while ascending to the apex of the demonic realm. He believes he must see it through once he starts something. It's in their best interest to eliminate potential problems, such as future vengeance, while their enemy is still in disarray. At the presence of these nobles right now, Roman wonders why they are all gathered here. His audacity triggered Viscount Barco to act as he likes when he's originally a commoner. Struggling to contain his boiling anger, his gaze remains fixed on Roman, who stands unwavering before him. He decides to address Roman's ignorance of the intricate laws that govern nobility dared to interfere in matters of war without a fair cause. Such actions are strictly forbidden within the confines of the Cairo kingdom. Roman doesn't look interested in hearing Viscount Barco, which angers him even more as he slams the table and yells at Roman that the Barco family will interrogate his actions and exact a heavy toll on the Dimitri family. With a final cutting remark, he reminds Roman of the unforgiving nature of his action. The Dimitri family, who have lived in peace despite having a fool of a son, will now be criticized by the nobles of the Northeast. Roman says nothing for a while, then calmly asks if he's finished talking. Even though a storm is raging within Viscount Barco, Roman is incredibly calm, looking around at the other nobles, before he explains to them what his causes are. The atmosphere subsides at Roman's words. Amidst the palpable tension, Roman's voice slices through the room like a blade, sharp and unforgiving. He states that Lawrence and Dimitri are initially intended for marriage. However, he decides to sever that union, leaving him branded as a fool who endures a divorce. A nervous silence envelops the room as everyone intently listens to Roman. Roman points his fingers at Viscount Barco and tells everyone that Anthony Barco threatens him to end his relationship with Flora. Gasps of astonishment ripple through the assembly, and Viscount Barco can't believe what he hears. Roman reveals that it happened during the second-to-last Barco family banquet he attended. He partakes in his hospitality, even raising a glass in celebration. Little does he know, he is walking into a carefully laid trap as the night ends with him drunk out of his mind and waking up beside Emily Barco. Anthony seizes upon this compromising situation as a pretext to threaten the annulment of his marriage to Lawrence. Hearing Roman's words, the nobles are perplexed. Suppose Roman breaks off his marriage with Lawrence due to Anthony's threats. In that case, he obviously has a justified cause for intervening. Unlike Roman, who doesn't even try to solve the problems even though his reputation is down to a ridiculous level, Jung Huck solves his problems by facing them head on. Nevertheless, seeing the unusual situation, Viscount Barco shouts with his eyes red from anger that Roman's cause is hearsay. But Roman already expects it, so he tells them his other reason. Viscount Barco feels like he is drowning further down in the mud by the moment. Hearing Roman's words and seeing his confident attitude, it feels like he is now playing into the palm of Roman. Roman confidently lies in front of everyone that Anthony molests Flora, and shocking by that incident, she decides to break up with him. The actual reason for breaking off the marriage between the two families. Roman is confident that Flora does her part in confirming his lies and turns the situation into a mess. Anthony Barco touches the woman, who is promised to marry him. And Roman knows that it is enough reason to intervene in the war between Barco and Lawrence. Adding the fact that he intervenes in the war only with his own and not his family's power to show her that he accepts the divorce without harsh feelings between them. It is a genuinely perfect reason, the argument makes sense, and Roman shows his cause to others. Now, Viscount Barco has no more moves left on the board. 
cold sweat flows down his forehead, and thousands of thoughts and calculations run through his mind to try and find a solution to the current situation. As if nothing is happening, Viscount Barco calms himself and sits back down, saying he will confirm the truth himself. His words eventually fade. Roman looks at Viscount Barco, and with the word choose, Roman gives two options. Whether he wants to end this with Anthony Barco being punished for his conflict with Roman or take things forward as a family matter. Both of the choices Roman gives to Viscount Barco are horrible. If there is an actual war with Dimitri, the side that obtains victory and the side that is defeated are clear as crystal. Even if he ignores losing the war against Lawrence despite borrowing money from the Golden Bank, Barco isn't so stupid that he would take the risk to wage war against the wealthiest family in the northeast region of Cairo. With their current condition, he is sure the Barco family will go extinct right after. Finally, Viscount Barco lets go of his pride and puts his head down. He decides to take responsibility for his defeat and brings out the eldest child so that he gets his punishment. Roman's voice is unbelievably cold. Even after he drives Viscount Barco to the edge of the cliff, as if he isn't satisfied, he reveals his intention of deciding what punishment Anthony should get. Outside of the meeting room, Anthony Barco gets down on his knees. Weeping because he's terrified of Roman, he grabs Viscount Barco's clothes and begs him earnestly. He knows it all too well. Even if he survives the duel, there is no chance Roman will let him go back with all of his limbs attached. Barco's eldest child, who his father thinks has grown up with dignity, is now sobbing like a three-year-old child and running away from reality. Seeing that, Viscount Barco yells at him to get it together because he should be prepared to do anything for the family's sake from the moment he is born. Viscount Barco asks Anthony to be strong and accept this reality before he leaves. Reality sinks in, Anthony finally realizes that the duel is unavoidable. He drenched in tears, can only hope that Roman shows mercy to him. Not long after, it's time for his judgment. In front of Viscount Barco and the other nobles who attended the arena, his limbs are trembling wildly. His face looks empty as a corpse, holding his sword shaking. There is no meaning in this duel. A new rise of star, Roman who defeats Homeros with a single hit against him. There is no way Anthony Barco, who doesn't even know how to use Aura can survive this. However, he still decides to do this for a reason. He doesn't swing his sword to defeat Roman but tries to appeal to him by apologizing. Roman silently listens to his pleading before he draws his sword and approaches Anthony. He gets even more scared with every breath he takes and begins to beg Roman to spare him. Even pleading he'll devote his life to him forever. It is embarrassing, to say the least. What Anthony Barco is currently showing is something the eldest son of a noble family should never show. Naturally, all the other nobles look at Viscount Barco, discomforted. The Viscount's face is red with anger because of how disappointed he is by his son. He has already driven him into giving up his pride, but he is begging and crawling here. Roman asks what kind of payment he can give as he slowly walks towards Anthony Barco, who is startled and holding the sword tightly. Roman menacingly swings his sword and says the Barco family is already over. Even their connections with the central government cannot help rectify his crimes. Obviously, Barco loses everything just by repaying the money they borrowed from the Golden Bank. Roman states that he will never forgive him for trapping him in a selfish plan. At this moment, Viscount Barco has an intense alarm ring in his head. And just as he is about to rush in and stop the duel, Roman coldly stabs Anthony. It goes straight to his abdomen, and blood spatters everywhere. Roman silently delivers his judgment to Anthony. In the current situation, there's nothing Viscount Barco can do. He doesn't know he's dealing with what once was a peak existence. Jung Huck withstands the threats of his brothers, who try to assassinate him every night, thrusts his sword into their hearts each time. In one of his battles with the eldest son called B. Koyal, his brother rambles about how his unwillingness to compromise with his enemies will become his boomerang. The eldest son is quite strong. Furthermore, beyond simply being strong, he shows tolerance to accept those he once considered enemies under him. Jung Huck also has no choice but to acknowledge him, however, that doesn't mean that he agrees with everything he chooses to do. Covered in blood from top to bottom, Jung Huck looks up at Hoi Yol and says that the only way for him to continue living is by crushing his enemy down entirely. Jung Huck's method for dealing with such situations differs from Hoi Yol's, and he intends to keep doing it in the future. The current situation is similar. There is no reason to keep the enemies alive. Death is the only way to block the possibility of a variable, and he has learned to use one's fear earlier. Roman runs his sword through Anthony's body, leaving him no chance to survive this. As his body falls, crashing on the ground, Viscount Barco runs, trying to reach what's left of his eldest son. Viscount Barco was wailing. He hurriedly embraces Anthony Barco's limp body. His high-quality fabric clothes are wholly stained with blood, 
and Viscount Barco tries to stop the blood flowing from his son's body. Although his son's body is still warm, it is meaningless. Roman wonders what's wrong with the situation since death is expected in a judgment duel. Viscount Barco can't accept his son's death, so he screams and orders his knight to kill Roman. At the sight of him shouting out loud while looking like a madman, the knights of Barco hesitate. They all witness Roman on the battlefield. They are sure whoever rushes at him first will definitely die. Viscount Barco now realizes what a terrible mistake he made. Roman offers a duel but never says he won't kill Anthony Barco. Only now does he understand that it was a trap from the beginning. Roman doesn't bring a single knight with him when he comes to Barco and pretends to compromise. He states that from the moment Anthony tries to trap him, he can't bear to live along with the Barco family, and warns those who are at a loss for words that they'll meet the same ending if they still associate themselves with the Barco family. Viscount Barco is stunned and yells at Roman that he won't get away with this, but Roman nonchalantly shrugs his threats and says that he'll keep attacking the Barco family until they fall entirely. On the surface, it is a threat to Barco, but those who are wise know it is a warning to all the nobles there. And just like that, leaving behind Viscount Barco to helplessly hold his dead son. A few days later, Viscount Barco attempts to escape at night. Even though he flees with minimal luggage and items, he is found dead in an unknown mountain. It is the moment the Barco family, one of the most prestigious families in the Northeast, is wholly destroyed. Dimitri's estate is lit with a whole moon on the same night. Out in the hallway, Hans asks Roman, who is shining under the moonlight, wondering where he's going. Roman says the full moon is beautiful so he takes a stroll around the estate. Hans is surprised to notice the red stain on Roman's clothes. Then he approaches Roman and takes his dirty clothes while telling him how anxious he is seeing him involved in war. Starting a new life in this world, Roman accepts Hans as his first person. That means his relationship with Hans is quite special. As the heavenly demon, Jung Hak slaughters numerous people before he obtains that position. He lives a life filled with so much carnage that his enemy's blood is enough to make a sea. Obviously, it isn't a life any normal human can live. In fact, Roman was willing to do his best for his people so they could avoid any danger. Because each person in his circle is crucial to him, and that is enough reason to throw himself into a pit of fire. While the issues related to the Barco family are still being discussed, Rihanna Dimitri goes to a banquet. The organizer of this meeting is Helena of the Meloc family. She is famous as a pro Dimitri, but when Barco collapses, she quickly organizes a banquet. She wants to show the fact that the Dimitri family now dominates the Northeast region. Naturally, the ladies of nobles move to attend the banquet. However, some new faces are also seen there. The ladies, who side with Barco, now welcome Rihanna with a fake smile on their faces. At Rihanna's arrival, all the ladies of the Northeast region gathered to welcome her. Rihanna receives their gifts and compliments as if it is natural to do that. There is something that people often misunderstand. They believe the Dimitri family has reached their current position due to Baron Romero's enormous wealth. However, those who work behind the scenes know it is only possible due to Rihanna's devotion. Rihanna creates her power by attracting ladies in the Northeast. It is a political thing that Baron Romero can't do, and Rihanna is able to form the pro Dimitri with the ladies she hangs out with. If she doesn't assemble the board in advance, Dimitri might collapse long before they can even rival Barco as a powerhouse. As the lady of Dimitri, Rihanna comes into the banquet and naturally proves that Dimitri's status has changed. She secretly quipped those who are on the side of Barco, while at the same time she tells them she will accept them. It is a small thing, but it leads to a tremendous difference. Rihanna knows all too well from her experiences that letting the sides of Barco come here is to show them room for cooperation. And after that, they chat for a while and have refreshments. The ladies, who sip tea while talking to each other, now begin to focus on one topic. Helena proposes an arranged marriage for Roman with one of the women in her family named Veronica. Her words make everyone stiff. The situation turns into a total mess due to the flames ignited by Helena. The ladies who attend this gathering show greed for Roman. Meanwhile, Rihanna calmly sips her tea while listening to the ladies advertise their daughter to be a suitable wife for Roman. Due to the incident with Barco, Roman's value skyrockets from just a mere idiot to a genius. Then Roman shows his potential by going against Homero's the four-star or a swordsman. It proves the Dimitri family will have a bright future and Roman is the most desirable groom in the Northeast. Rihanna puts the teacup down. The current atmosphere is alright. Nevertheless, she has no intention of using her son for any political gain. Rihanna draws a clear line, there is no arranged marriage. Still, the problem is that her words ignite rivalry among the ladies. In other words, regardless of the status, the one who captures the heart of Roman wins. The expressions of the noble wives change instantly. Meanwhile, in Lawrence, after the war is over, Flora locks herself in her room. Fortunately, Lawrence survives, but her experiences on the field give her too much of a shock. She realizes that she needs strength to live in the world. 
The war between Lawrence and Barco is one where it is natural for them to lose. She advises the Viscount to stock the food and last all the way through the winter because she reads it in the books, but that is nothing like the reality she sees. The helplessness she feels at this time is horrible. As she watches the castle walls destroyed, Flora feels her mind shatter. However, Roman is different. Due to the strength of a single individual, Barco is defeated, and the war is won. The confidence and strength somehow look different in Roman, and she somehow wants to be like him. The imaginary being who is confident in everything begins to overlap with Roman at one point. She unknowingly blushes and immediately shakes her head to get rid of the feeling. She can't believe that someone who is selfish and only cares about their interests can be her ideal type. Finally, she closes her book and decides to get some fresh air. Walking outside, she wants to know more about how Roman can be so strong. The problem is that her relationship with him is broken, and she has no way of seeing Roman again. Out of nowhere, she hears someone call her. It is a familiar face. She is a woman with typical beautiful features and has sky-blue hair. She is her cousin, Sylvia. It is surprising, and Flora wonders what can bring her here. After a while, Flora goes to her father, surprised by the news that the Lawrence family is hosting a party in Dimitri. She wants to know why her father doesn't tell her anything. However, the answer she is given is unexpected. Viscount Lawrence looks at Flora stiffly and realizes something about her. The war with Barco is something Viscount Lawrence seriously ponders. In particular, most of it is about Flora's change. He constantly thinks of her as a flower he needs to protect. But still, she shows her true self amid the crisis. Flora is a person who is capable of doing so much more, but due to his lack of insight, her full potential has yet to come out. They are able to win the war because of her judgment and knowledge of what to do in a situation where everyone has given up by bringing Roman Dimitri into the battle. So, from now on, he supports any way of life she wants to live. This is undoubtedly an inspiring statement, and Flora is shocked to hear it. Viscount Lawrence looks at Flora with eyes filled with love. Nevertheless, the problem is that Flora wants something else. She actually wants to go to the banquet. In the future, he wants Flora to live independently. However, he still feels greedy for Roman. Now Flora realizes her father is trying to reconnect the thread between them and Dimitri through Sylvia. Flora understands his intention. The Viscount wants her to help Sylvia and acts as her guide. Viscount Lawrence tells her that she doesn't have to go, but Flora is determined to go. So, it is decided that Flora will attend the banquet. A piece of unbelievable news arrives at Valhalla Temple, the organization that usually manages the rankings through ranking battles. Priest Willis, who manages the temple's branch in Cairo, frowns hearing what the fuss on northeast region of the Cairo kingdom is so remote that no one even bats an eye on it. He wonders who Roman Dimitri is and decides to come to check it for himself because if this report is accurate, it means that an unprecedented genius was born in the Cairo kingdom. Flora, Sylvia, and other noble families visit Dimitri together this afternoon. The party is scheduled for the evening, but many arrive early. Except for Flora, everyone has a clear purpose. It is to snatch Roman, so they want to get to the place in advance. Walking through the center, the ladies of noble families show a dissatisfied reaction, and Sylvia is quite disappointed because Dimitri looks quite dull. Walking deeper into the estate, they see a group of miners walking by. Their bodies look dusty as if they have just finished their jobs, and their faces are so black that they can't even be recognized. As the miners approach and create some dust in the surroundings, some of the women complain about their dresses getting dirty. It is a double standard. Nobles in the northeast region acknowledge the power of Dimitri. Still, knowing that Dimitri is a family originating from commoners, they think Dimitri is different from those of noble births. However, Flora's reaction is different as she knows that the miners are the source of wealth for Dimitri. She looks at them with curious eyes. Nevertheless, when she recognizes someone within them, she is utterly shocked. She is sure of the familiar face, one of the miners is Roman Dimitri. At first, she thinks she sees it wrong. However, the face visible under the hard hat is clearly that of Roman Dimitri. And just now, Hans rushes toward Roman. Hans wipes Roman's face with his handkerchief while nagging him for always returning from the mine covered in dust. The ears of the noble women, along with Sylvia, hears it. Now that the rest of the sons leave Dimitri, there is only one person Hans can call a young master and that is Roman. That instant, all noble women's eyes turn bright after seeing him. Looking carefully at her prey, a naughty smile appears on Sylvia's face. Even though his face is messed up due to the dust from the mine, Sylvia can still notice how handsome he is. She can't see them clearly because of the clothes he has on, but the gleaming muscles with sweat show her an incredible scene. At first, she comes to Lawrence due to her uncle's request, but she doesn't expect Roman to be any good. However, now that she sees him, it isn't just that the appearance of the Roman is refined 
but he is in absolutely perfect condition. There is a rumor that the second child has a high chance of taking the position of the heir. But after seeing Roman with the minors, she believes Baron Romero must have ordered him to do this in order to bring favor to Roman's status. After finishing her analysis, Sylvia encourages the noble women to approach Roman. She greets him and thanks him for helping her family in the war against the Barco family. Roman nonchalantly answers only to welcome them. Without even giving any more attention to Sylvia, Roman then turns and leaves with Hans. At this moment, Flora who is in the distance, bursts into laughter. Truly, Roman is entirely consistent with his attitude. Meanwhile, as Hans follows Roman, he tells him to act nicer because some people will attend the banquet later. But Roman says that he doesn't intend to be nice to them based on the fact they look down on the miners. Which makes Hans wonder how long he plans to work in the mine. Even though the Lord doesn't give any orders for him to do it, some begin to talk about his actual intention. Roman explains that he does what he does because he knows Dimitri's roots are the blacksmiths as well as the iron mine. Roman wants to experience and empathize with it. Han stops walking as tears well up from within. Indeed, Roman have grown up to be fine nobles. That made him so proud to be able to serve Roman. A while later, Roman arrives at the training ground. On the massive arena, dozens of men are already sweating. They are swinging their swords at Chris' command. The war with Barco is an experience that arouses a blind loyalty within them. Especially when Roman defeats a four-star swordsman and Chris defeats a three-star swordsman. After seeing that, their perception changes. They no longer think Roman and Chris are at a level around them, so they keep pushing themselves harder to be at their level. Roman watches the training from the side. He's confident that with his soldiers, he already covers the basics of four. But he also needs intelligent forces that can investigate his target inside and out. But he currently doesn't have the resources to do it, so he calls Chris instead. Chris runs at the call, and the soldiers continue to train regardless of that. Roman asks about the progress with the training, and Chris is confident that the soldiers can quickly develop their strength. The war is already over, but Roman feels the need to expand his power. Thus, he wants to teach Chris a new technique, surprising Chris. Roman explains that since he has a different starting line than the others and already has his bubble of methods, he knows Chris finds it hard to accept new things. Now Roman believes that Chris is ready to be taught. Seeing Chris looking at him with burning passion without answering, Roman continues to say that the name of the sword technique he will teach him is Lightning Flash. That technique, known as one of the great ten techniques of Miram, is now will be passed down to Chris. Soon, the time for the banquet arrives. Roman's appearance, whom everyone is waiting for, is magnificent, stunning the people who attended. Roman looks around and greets them. There is not even the slightest stern look on him now. As this is a banquet being held for him, Roman understands and acts like the protagonist of the party. And despite being rejected by him earlier, the noble women still show interest in him. When one of the ladies asks why he leaves so quickly earlier in the afternoon, Roman replies that he doesn't look presentable after working in the mine all day. A chorus of understanding echoes, and Roman plays the part. Then Sylvia begins to praise him for working directly in the mines as the firstborn of the Dimitri family, and she blatantly says how nice it would be if she had a spouse like him. Roman thanks her for the undeserved praise, and with that, he ends their conversation. Although he kindly accepts questions from all directions, he never allows them much liberty. As time goes by, Roman, who has been tormented by women for a long time by their idle chat, secretly moves away from the banquet, and just then, he hears a familiar voice from behind. The owner of the voice praises Roman for his acting skills. It is none other than Flora. He doesn't have to put up a kind face in a place where no one is watching, so he speaks coldly to her. Note the fact that his act in the banquet is necessary. It surprises Flora because she initially thinks Roman doesn't care about the relationships between people. Roman tells her that, usually it is true. However, this is a banquet hosted by the Lawrence family for him, and his parents and their guests watch. That means he must deviate from his usual behavior and act with minimal courtesy. Just like when Roman first meets Flora, he is in robes. Thinking that the smell of blood isn't polite, he sprays some perfume and goes out. Roman is such a kind person. Still, even though he is friendly, he shows appropriate behavior when needed. Come to think of it, the change is all her fault. Roman was always kind to her, but Flora didn't even notice it. He is a consistent person, so she feels more curious. She wonders how Roman can be so firm in his character. Then, she asks why he works with miners instead of blacksmiths. Roman asks her back about what makes Lawrence thrive today. Flora can't make out an answer. So, Roman explains that people often think Lawrence is revived due to their crops and fertile soil, but that isn't the case. The Lawrence family succeeds in commerce. They know how to use the grown crops and sell them for the correct prices. Lawrence was able to stand tall because they were proficient in business. And that's why Viscount Lawrence's younger brother also uses that talent to succeed as a merchant in the capital. Hearing those words, Flora is utterly stunned. 
She's amazed by the fact that Roman knows about the history of each respective family with such accuracy. But it leaves her with a nagging question of why he's working with the miners. Roman believes that without the miners working hard every day, Dimitri wouldn't be as successful as it is now. So, it is in his best interest to spend time with miners to try to understand and empathize with them, as that is the duty of the Dimitri family. Seeing Roman come out assertively, Flora loses her words for a moment. Thus, the conversation ends as Roman Dimitri turns back without any more words. She smiles for finally able to clear her head. She also feels glad talking to Roman makes her even more confident with her dreams. A few days later, Flora leaves Dimitri and heads straight for the capital. It is the moment the flower of Lawrence, the plant in the greenhouse leaves and steps out into the world. Time goes by. Hendrik and Jacob, the two pillars of Dimitri often spend time together. While working hard, they often have a small break and take down the sweet drink. Jacob excited to tell him what happened. Roughly half a month ago, Roman gets permission from Jacob, the master of the iron mines. And hearing that news, the miners are a bit displeased. No one responds positively to the news. Unless Roman is somehow a worker who does actual labor, he is just an inconvenient existence. In an obviously uncomfortable situation, the miners express their dissatisfaction. In particular, Morkin, a veteran miner, reacts harshly. Dimitri, known as the mining city, comprises miners and blacksmiths, yet blacksmiths are praised better. So, he encourages his friends to show Roman how hard it is to work in these mines. Everyone instantly cheers, agreeing with him. On the next day, Roman dresses up and heads to the iron mine early in the morning. Obviously, there is no welcome ceremony for Roman. Everyone is busy yawning due to the lack of sleep and clearly ignores Roman. They stretched out their bodies as listening to Jacob's order, the master of Iron Mine. After the morning speech, the miners move busily. While Roman is working, he carefully thinks about everything he sees here. To plan for the future, he needs to understand the land he lives in, how the people of Dimitri live, how much power there is, and what he can do with it. Roman believes this is a much-needed process and is determined to know everything about it. All the seniors begin to move the soil and ore into the carts, and Roman silently helps them. He first moves the soil and iron together with them and drags it out when the cart is full. From then on, it is a simple repetition. After some time, Roman notices how organized their work is. The division of work is clear, and as a result of examining the tunnels during the mining, Roman realizes the safety is adequate. Now, Roman hears an explanation from a miner as he wonders why Dimitri is famous for their forges. The reason that Dimitri is in the spotlight isn't simply because it has a forge that is quite good. Because of the iron ore is in the highest quality, the people of Cairo recognize the value of ironworks from Dimitri. Dimitri is able to make a lot of profit as it handles the mining and processing of the iron ore with the human resources of the land. Honestly, what he says is something Roman already knows. However, after listening to it from a miner's perspective, he realizes that the wealth of the Dimitri family might be more significant than he initially thought. Roman tries asking the miners questions, but Morkin, who is passing by, warns him that this is not the time for idle conversation, stunning the old man. Nevertheless, Morkin looks at Roman, waiting for him to get angry. However, Roman apologizes instead. His reaction is different from what he expected, and Morkin is left speechless. Watching Roman head back to work, Morkin can't take his eyes off him. A week after he worked with the mines, he talked to a miner when he asked them a few questions, but no miner was willing to speak with him daily. As Roman fills his stomach with thick bread and soup, he assumes this is their way of marking their territory. From the first day, Roman knows that he is being rejected here. While he eats, Morkin suddenly comes and sits before Roman. He wonders why Roman works at the mine. On the first day, Morkin is a bit nervous. He works around the point where Roman is working on purpose and keeps an eye on Roman, trying to catch him red-handed, skipping work. However, contrary to that, Roman works harder than he thinks. He thinks he will only pretend to work, but Roman is actually able to meet the quota like the others. It is surprising. No matter what he thinks, Roman's actions make no sense. At first, he thinks Roman is doing work in the mine to become the heir. But, there is no order for Roman to work in the mine from the Baron. Hearing that shocking news, his biased perspective on Roman vanishes wholly. Roman looks at Morkin then asks whether he wants to hear the ideal or realistic reason. And just as Roman tells Hans, it is because he wants to experience firsthand what the daily life in Dimitri is like. Morkin doubts that Roman needs to go this far to understand it. But Roman believes that as long as he has the last name Dimitri, it will be his duty. These are the words one wants to hear from their leaders, and in an instant, his wariness against Roman vanishes. And the real reason comes from the fact that he isn't the lord of Dimitri. Even though Dimitri has enormous wealth, it belongs to his father, not Roman. So he intends to find out how much wealth Dimitri has accumulated, exactly how the estate works, and to demand his share rightfully. Here's the absurd and straightforward answer, Morkin can't help but laugh. 
he thinks Roman comes to the mind to aim for the successor's position. Ultimately, it means Roman wanted to take advantage of the Iron Mine. Although, Morkin interprets it differently. Morkin is excited to learn that Roman comes to the mine instead of the smithy, which means he acknowledges the miner's worth. So Morkin doesn't care about being taken advantage of and offers to answer any questions Roman might have. From this point onward, the conversation proceeds smoothly. Beyond the kingdom's northern estate lies endless range, and if everything up there is developed, then Dimitri estate will be the wealthiest family in the northeast. However, Morkin says that Dimitri isn't very productive due to the risk of the job itself. Despite Baron Romero giving them enough support to make the work here as safe as possible, the mining is still dangerous. Suddenly, an earthquake occurred from the mine. Someone informs Morkin that an accident has occurred in the Eighth Tunnel, trapping someone that's still working in it. He immediately realizes the severity of the situation, and the miners can only helplessly watch the sinking hole. It is a difficult situation because he can't send someone to rescue him. However, before Morkin can decide what to do next, Roman steps forward and volunteers to go down the collapsed tunnel. Hearing that, everyone, including Morkin, is stunned. Courage and recklessness are different things. And obviously, Morkin judges Roman to be reckless. But Roman looks at Morkin sharply and argues that it's a critical moment where they could waste just by thinking it through. Morkin is stunned by his words as Roman clearly determines to save the worker inside and tells him to prepare to tend to the injured. There is no time to delay. Thus, Roman leaves Morkin behind and quickly moves to where the accident happens. He goes down the passage leading to Tunnel 8. Roman shows his movements as swiftly as a beast by using his power. Within a few seconds, he is able to go deep into the mine. After a few minutes, he comes out with the wounded worker. Roman notices a large crowd gathered near him. Then, he lays the wounded down on the ground, putting a splint on his leg. As he finishes, he orders the other workers to bring the wounded to a doctor and will cover the expenses. Soon, two workers pick up the wounded person, quickly put him on a stretcher, and go out. Eventually, Roman gets up and says to everyone that they need to accept the incident as the fate of a miner. Even if they prepare thoroughly, it cannot be helped when such disasters happen. From now on, as a person who bears the name Dimitri, Roman has tried to solve all these difficulties by any means possible. At this moment, Morkin understands it. He feels an emotion that can't be described in words. Back at the castle, Roman is called by his father, who gets informed of the news of the collapse. Baron Romero expresses his concern and anger because he worked there when he was young. And because of that, he knows how dangerous Roman's actions are. He can't afford to lose his son's life for another's. But Roman has a thought of his own, and he won't change his decision making Baron Romero angrier. As someone who carries the name of Dimitri, he believes this is what he means to do. Baron Romero sighs. Even though his heart hurts at the thought of his son making such a decision, he is also a bit happy to see his son act with such pride. Because he is the Lord of Dimitri, he thinks his son should at least learn to handle steel rather than dig out ore. Roman explains that in order to understand their estate, he must work in the iron mine. Although Dimitri is usually praised for its reputation for smelting in the forge, the iron mines make that happen in the end. So, the only choice for Roman is to go to the mine. Baron Romero hears his explanation and asks what Roman has learned after working there. And Roman states that he is able to see firsthand what difficulties the miners of Dimitri are going through. Roman also observes how his father cares about their safety precautions. Nevertheless, mining is still risky even though the safety is managed through current methods since they're dealing with a natural disaster. And as Baron Romero does his best for them, he doesn't think there is anything else he can do now. For safety reasons, he made rules to limit the number of people entering the mines. However, Roman thinks that he has to create results somehow. He advises his father to utilize magic artifacts. However, Baron Romero can only think that his son is genuinely out of touch with reality. The intention to use them for safety is good. But one magic artifact costs a lot of money, and bringing enough artifacts to protect the entire tunnel will cost them an astronomical amount. Roman apparently knows of that fact. Still, he believes that installing an artifact that forms an air shield in emergencies prepares for a collapse will ensure the rise of the production of the ores. This is such a perfect argument. Thus, after contemplating for a while, Baron Romero looks at his son proudly and asks how much he needs to invest. But he also warns Roman that his calculation could miss and he needs to be ready to face a loss. In the world of Murum, two different sects are recognized for their information handling. They are the Beggar's Union and the Ignoble Clan. The two have something in common. They use their identities as either beggars or servers to listen to the information people talk about. And Roman chose the Iron Mines to extend his information sources. Because they are everything to Dimitri and he wants to gather all the information through them. Yet, as Roman looks at the continent map, he feels unsatisfied. Roman's concept of an information guild is not just inside the northeast region of Cairo. He intends to gather information from all over the continent. 
Although the local mines serve as the main force, he hopes there is also a budget and force with which it grows and resembles the ignoble clan. Thus, Roman has other thoughts. He needs a veteran person who can gather much information from the miners and connect with the merchants to gain information from beyond the northeast region. And there is one person who fits that description. After the war is over, Chris summons all of Roman's soldiers. That day, Lucas couldn't believe when Chris said he would teach them mana cultivation and sword technique. This is a gift from Roman to all of them after they joined him in the war. Upon hearing this, other soldiers are surprised as well. Indeed, this is an unbelievable statement. Mana cultivation is a systematic arrangement of a unique method of handling mana. Also, it is something that cannot be learned by just anyone, making its value immeasurable. Lucas is sure that Chris only teaches them some random technique that is easy to find. No matter how loyal a soldier might be to Roman, the time they all spend with him is too little for him to give up such treasure. Chris starts by telling the soldiers the technique's name is Asura Cultivation. That means the ghost of the battlefield. After a few minutes of training, Lucas is surprised when he somehow realizes this technique is a treasure. He can feel the mana around him. His body is susceptible, and he can feel the wind grazing his skin. The Asura Sword technique is the perfect combat style to utilize the power of cultivation technique. He can channel his mana through his sword as he fights, and his long-lost dream is now in his grasp. He is certain, Roman Dimitri is a much greater person than he initially thinks. Now that he can use mana and become an aura swordsman, he gets more excited about training and fighting his comrades. In such a situation, when Lucas hears Roman offers him to become the leader of the Information Guild, he doesn't even think much before bluntly rejecting it. Roman wonders why he doesn't want to do it. Seeing that Lucas is a veteran mercenary, he has an extensive network, as well as having a fantastic ability to respond to variables. But Lucas reasons the order to leave and make an information guild is something he can never accept since he has already pledged his loyalty to Roman. Nevertheless, Roman smiles, knowing that Lucas is an excellent liar. He knows Lucas is so obsessed with the Asura cultivation and sword technique making him doesn't want to consider taking over another position. Roman says that the Asura cultivation and sword technique, which they considered a great treasure, is almost nothing major to Roman. They are just gifts to those who follow him into the battlefield and risk their lives. Finally, Roman tells him to ponder what kind of gifts he'll give to someone more than a soldier to Roman. Roman's words are too shocking for Lucas, whose life has significantly changed even though Roman has shared only a little bit of his knowledge. At this moment, Lucas instantly understands how he needs to respond. He immediately bows and vows to create the best intelligence guild to ever exist on the entire Salamander continent, and Roman is convinced that Lucas is the perfect man to lead the Vile Clan. The next day, Roman goes back to the mine. As soon as Roman comes into their vision, all the miners greet him happily. Numerous people rush in to thank him for bringing in the safety equipment consisting of magic artifacts after he personally talked with Baron Romero, and among them is also the father of the man who is wounded previously, whom Roman has saved. He now kneels and thanks Roman for saving his son's life. Ignoring those calculating profits before meeting the miners, Roman realizes his decision isn't wrong after seeing these people with pure happiness in their faces, thanking him. From this day onward, Dimitri's people's attention turns to Roman. Naturally, such a situation puts Baron Romero into serious trouble. Time passes quickly after that. Now, it has been a month since the war with Barco ended. At the Dimitri family's regular meeting, the family's vassals report everything that has happened in the last month. With the fall of the Barco family, there is no longer a power that rivals the Dimitri family. Due to the absence of a rival, the pro-Barco forces express their desire to form an alliance with Dimitri in the coming days, and some of them are willing to pay a fair price for it as well. But obviously, Dimitri's people know the truth. If another force like Barco emerges, they will betray Dimitri without a second thought. So that's why Baron Romero outright rejects the request from forces who are overly hostile to Dimitri. The second agenda is about their military power. Dimitri has the best military power in the northeast region of Cairo, but the last incident raised their awareness. Barco shows them the power of creating variables in war by borrowing external forces like the Flare and Homero. So, Jonathan suggests expanding the army and securing enough magic weapons to prepare for these variables. Baron Romero's thoughts are no different, and he decides to invest a significant amount of money into the military. Furthermore, there is good news as well. Roman's prediction is correct. Even though it takes an astronomical amount to install the magical artifacts throughout the tunnel, the iron mine's production increased by 30% in a short period. It is a virtuous cycle of investment. By investing first, the problem of safety in the iron mine is solved and the workers are now equipped with an environment where they can concentrate on their work properly. Roman is correct when he chooses to work in the iron mine, experiences firsthand what problems might arise in the future, and devises the ideal way to solve the problem. 
Because of this, Roman's reputation quickly changes all over the place. Eventually, Jonathan asks Baron Romero about his plans for the succession of Dimitri. Baron Romero already knows this comes up. Three years ago, he selected Rodwell as the next lord. Because Roman's actions did not suit the position of the lord back then, and he couldn't trust his first son either. However, now, things are different. Roman proves himself to be the ideal leader when he defeats Homeros in the war against Barco, and he even solves the safety problem of the iron mine in the most ideal way. Everyone agrees that Roman's recent actions are too shocking. Then, one of the vassals suggests a fair competition between Rodwell and Roman since the selection of a successor has yet to be officially confirmed. Hearing that, Baron Romero goes quiet. There is a ripple in his thoughts, and he can't make any hasty decision in a situation where the succession structure could be messed up. Even though both of them are his sons, they have different tendencies, and he is afraid of the conflict that will arise between them in the future. In the end, Baron Romero decides to keep watching the situation and thinks about what to do afterward. After the meeting of this day, Baron Romero's troubles deepen. Thus, after the meeting is finished, he calls for Hans, where currently is Roman's closest confidant. Baron Romero goes straight to the point and asks if Roman is suited to be the heir of the Dimitri family. The direct question naturally brings silence along with it. Hans looks troubled initially, but then he says frankly, if he had asked him three months ago, he would have said no. However, the current Roman is different. Hans explains that Roman works in the mind to understand the reality of the people of Dimitri when no one forces him to do so. As a bearer of Dimitri's surname, Roman is sure to do his obligations despite risks that can cost him his life. Baron Romero is now even more troubled. He thinks Hans' experience would be helpful to him, but the guy blindly praises Roman, which adds even more confusion. So, he decides to meet the master of the iron mine, Jacob. And not long after, Jacob arrives with Morkin. He knows that Baron Romero wants to know what happens on the day of the incident in the mine, so he brings him. Morkin is nervous when he introduces himself, but his is a name familiar to Baron Romero. Then, Morkin explains that the accident occurred about a week after Roman joined to work in the mine. A worker was injured in the collapsed mine, and he was present there at this time. Roman orders the safe rescue of the worker, according to the manual. Refusing to wait any longer, Roman decides to save the worker by himself. In the end, it's just like Hans says, all because Roman carries the name of Dimitri. He takes the risk to save the miner trapped in the collapsed tunnel. Now, Baron Romero hears everything he wants to hear. He feels troubled at the tables that have turned. Everyone wants Roman to be the successor, but that doesn't mean everything has already been decided. He still needs to ask the master blacksmith, Hendrik. A few days ago, Hendrik was working in front of the scorching flames of the furnace like any other day, when one of his employees informed him of a request in Roman's name. At first, he is nervous as he asks whether or not they should take the order. But unexpectedly, Hendrik tells him to take the order and quickly grab their stuff. Initially, Hendrik wants to refuse the order. But after hearing what happens in the mine, he feels sorry for mistreating Roman. After a while, his shop is full of broken weapons and armor. Some begin to wonder how they managed to break it this badly. Hendrik, who is checking the iron piled up, is shocked when he sees a sword that is left out. It's none other than the salamander. As he picks it up, the twinkling light glides down the blade smoothly and the grip is gentle. The strength of the blade as he holds it feels firm. Hendrik is completely mesmerized by it, knowing that a sword like this is difficult to find even in Dimitri's estate. Above everything else, there is something Hendrik admires a lot. Hendrik then takes the sword to the flames. The flames engulf the sword astoundingly. To be precise, the flames that are supposed to burn all around show the tendency to burn only a specific path, as if a gravitational force is drawing them out. That means it can receive the energy in nature, proving it is different from other ironworks. It is clear as crystal that this is something that fills any aura swordsman with joy. Hendrik has always prided himself on being the best on the continent for his iron handling skills, but doing something like increasing mana reactivity to a sword is entirely another matter. At the sight of iron shining as if it is new, Chris jumps up, genuinely surprised that it takes this fast to finish all of them. The blacksmith, who looks tired, explains that Hendrik brings in all the blacksmiths who can be afforded and sticks them to this work, and after working three days straight, they finally see sunlight again. Due to the lack of sleep, Hendrik has a blank expression, but his eyes burn excitedly and seek something. He quickly wants to hear who makes the sword. Seeing that look, Roman smirks. Roman knows Hendrik will react like this, so he tells him that he doesn't get the sword anywhere. Hendrik is initially confused by this. Roman smiles and says that he makes the sword himself. Hendrik's face is dyed with shock. The sword being made by Roman is something Hendrik can't believe. No, it is something he can't even imagine. 
His voice clearly exhibits his anger. He doesn't even want to confirm the truth with Roman anymore. As if Roman understands his reaction, he calmly says that he made the sword and names it after the continent, Salamander. Hendrik's face glows red, thinking Roman is just making fun of him. Roman knows that seeing is believing, so he shows Hendrik how he makes that sword, knowing full well that Hendrik can tell if his forging skills are that capable. While going to the cabin, Roman explains he forges a sword for himself that he can entrust his life with whenever there is a significant battle. Hendrik follows him along to see him work in the cabin, but he doesn't like how Roman empathizes with the feelings of a blacksmith when forging metal. Roman reaches out to the heated metal in the furnace and places it on top of an anvil. He takes his top off, completely ignoring the safety precautions by wearing protective gear. Upon seeing it, Hendrik sighs, thinking that Roman doesn't even know the basics of being a blacksmith. Precisely at this moment Roman strikes the iron with his hammer and Hendrik's expression changes completely. It is a strong and clear banging sound of metal as the muscles in Roman's body swell up. And while the young master strikes the iron earnestly with his hammer, Hendrik can't help but keep gazing at him. The way blacksmiths handle iron in this world and the way Miram's blacksmiths handle iron is different. Miram's blacksmiths only prioritize the smooth operation of key to make a sword that amplifies the efficiency of the key to the maximum. The fire keeps getting stronger and burning his skin. He considers the process of making a sword as a part of training. Assimilating the sword while using mana is how the sword will match his needs. It is as if he is in a state of trance, Roman is completely absorbed in forging his sword. Seeing Roman strike the steel without a single hint of a distraction makes Hendrik's common sense collapse. Roman, whom Hendrik has seen until now, clearly does not have even the slightest bit of interest in the forge, but his current attitude of hammering the iron proves that he is a skilled craftsman. Somehow, it reminds him of Baron Romero's prime days as a blacksmith. Until the sun sets, Roman is immersed in his work, and Hendrik gazes at the scene carefully. Now, Hendrik believes Roman's words of forging Salamander to be true as he sees him working in the smithy. After Roman finishes his work, Hendrik apologizes, and in order to fully settle down as one of Dimitri's heirs, he decides it is necessary to improve his relationship with Hendrik, so he decides to give Salamander to him. Hearing Roman's words, Hendrik is in awe. Roman explains that he is forging a new sword for himself, giving him Salamander as a gift to replace Hendrik's sword that Roman sold in the past. Three years ago, in the meeting to decide the successor of Dimitri, Hendrik is furious and remarks that Rodwell is more suitable to take the position as the heir than Roman. But now Roman has drastically changed since then. What Hendrik considers necessary for Dimitri's successor is whether he understands the work of a blacksmith. He entirely agrees that Roman is the perfect candidate as the heir of the Dimitri family. Baron Romero is in disbelief and asks if he really means it. Hendrik explains the time when Roman sent the blacksmiths a request for ironworks to equip his soldiers with, and he told him to take those that were not good because of his stormy relationship with him. But Roman only glares at him while telling him that his act of handing over those items to soldiers is no different from murder. It violates his values as a craftsman, and that night, he carefully reflects on his actions while thinking about them. And today, he witnesses Roman forge his sword directly at the cabin. His concentration on the work while facing the scorching heat in front of the fire is admirable. Hendrik then handed Baron Romero Salamander, whom Roman gave him as a gift. Baron Romero is shocked at the sight of the sword shining brilliantly under the light and wonders how Romans could make such an incredible sword. This isn't simply a result of interest but proof that Roman is qualified enough to fight in the succession race. The situation has now changed. Hendrik initially opposed making Roman the successor. Now, he bows and tries to persuade Baron Romero to make Roman the heir to the throne. After that, Baron Romero, who sends Hendrik back, stays in his office and rereads the letter he received a year ago. It is Rodwell's second letter. He was just a kid back then. Still, unlike Baron Romero, who wants a simple life, he is very ambitious. He proves it by going to Cairo Royal Academy, the highest educational institution in the Cairo Kingdom, and being promoted to S-Class. He even enlists in the Western Front as a commanding officer. Both Roman and Rodwell are excellent sons. Though, looking at the recent events, Roman isn't someone who can be considered just talented. Roman has a marvelous talent that takes Dimitri's fame to the entire continent, not just Cairo. His worries are deep, and he finally makes a decision. Once Rodwell graduates from the academy and Roman fulfills his duty in the military, the race for succession is declared. After a few days, Priest Willis and his companion arrive at Dimitri. He is allowed to meet with Baron Romero right away. Willis introduces himself as the priest of the Valhalla Temple's Cairo branch. He states that he hears about the rumors of Roman defeating Homeros, who is ranked 49th in the ranking. So he wants to come and meet Roman to see whether he can be reflected in the ranking. A family with a ranker, even if it is the lowest ranker, is bound to be recognized by the world. And Baron Romero can't hide his joy. But because Roman works in the smithy for a few days, he advises Willis to rest and look around the estate. 
most don't have much to do when they visit others, so Willis doesn't turn down the offer. Hans then guides him around the estate. It is so that he can take him directly to Roman tomorrow. In the meantime, Hans explains about Dimitri's estate as they walk around the hall. When he arrives at what seems like a training ground, he hears the passionate voices of the soldiers and gets intrigued by it. He sees a group of people training and asks Hans if he can see them up close. After they complete the basic training, a one-on-one -on -one fight begins. In the first spar, both of their swords clash with a loud thud. Kevin makes the first attack and quickly retreats after Pucky counters him with a blow that overpowers him. Then Pucky mocks Kevin for having a weak defense strategy, and Kevin replies that he should say that after he wins. Both of them get serious when Aura starts to engulf their bodies, making Willis lose words, realizing that they're Aura swordsmen. Kevin and Pucky charge toward each other with their swords gleaming with mana. Roman recruited 30 private soldiers due to the enlistment notice. Still, there is not a single Aura swordsman among them. Pucky is only a C-class mercenary, one level lower than Lucas. Even now, he doesn't realize what Roman means when he says he was born with a martial physique. After the war, Roman soldiers learned the Asura technique, and Pucky could manifest mana in less than a month. In the beginning, people like Lucas doubt the technique they are being taught. No matter how wealthy Dimitri is, they don't think Romans would give such a considerable technique to ordinary soldiers. However, they all changed their mind after experiencing the technique firsthand and seeing Pucky succeed. Roman's gifts were treasures they wouldn't be able to buy even if they had billions of coins. Accordingly, things change, and now the soldiers risk their lives to become strong and get over the wall blocking their growth. Naturally, this vicious atmosphere creates a sense of competition, and the extreme clash between Kevin and Pucky is the result of such things. Pucky moves with magnificent force. Kevin is the one who manifests Aura earlier, but Pucky still has the upper hand due to his physical build. His explosive attacks create a synergy with the power of Aura, and Kevin has no choice but to be pushed back due to those attacks. Nevertheless, Kevin's expression doesn't change. Even the slightest mistake can lead to death, but Kevin doesn't run away. Among the soldiers, Kevin is known as Ghost, and Pucky is aware of how scary he is. He moves to land another attack, and Kevin counters from below. The sword extends from Kevin's hand and aims right below Pucky's chin. His eyes flutter wide, seeing the attack aim at such a vital spot. So, he blocks the attack. As Pucky comes to his senses, he begins to wonder if Kevin must aim at such a vital part. Kevin ignores his remark and tells him to be more serious. Then, with lightning speed, Kevin moves behind Pucky and puts his sword on his neck. If this is a real war, Pucky will surely lose his life. Naturally, all of it is seen by Willis, who is utterly stunned now. The training is shocking right from the start. It is as if he is looking at a miniature version of Valhalla Empire itself. Admiration rises from within him. They are showing perfect sword techniques. Seeing the sword technique that systematically pushes the opponent, he doubts whether these people are ordinary soldiers. Willis wonders since Dimitri owns this much power, and he's now certain that the estate has military power beyond the scale of a countryside family. Then he hears his companion's voice, who's clearly shocked as well, wondering if Dimitri is actually a mining city. Willis is certain they are not ordinary soldiers and thinks they must belong to the family. However, Hans, listening to them, explains that they do not belong to the family and have sworn allegiance only to Roman. Hearing those words, Willis falls into shock once again. Valhalla is known as the Empire of Warriors. The soldiers of Valhalla have superior combat power, but they don't show qualities like the soldiers of Roman. He holds hands and demands answers as to why they treat Aura swordsmen like mere soldiers. He thinks Dimitri invests a lot of money in hiring Aura swordsmen since that is the most logical explanation. Nevertheless, Hans informs him that Kevin and Pucky are not Aura swordsmen until recently. Kevin comes from the slums, and Roman personally takes him in. Also, Pucky is a C-class mercenary who passes the test and enlists as Roman's soldier. They only get stronger after being taught by Roman. Willis is losing for words and keeps wondering who Roman actually is. The next day, Willis waits for Roman with a cup of tea. It isn't the appointment time yet, so he waits calmly as the time comes and the door opens. He puts down the teacup. After develops an observant eye after meeting a lot of people, Willis is convinced that Roman is definitely a person accustomed to living his life as someone powerful. After a brief introduction, he goes to the point. Roman confirms the rumor that he defeated Homeros as if it wasn't a big deal. Seeing Roman's reaction, Willis tells him Homeros is not the only reason why it's such a huge accomplishment. Roman is able to reach the level of 3-star in just his 20s, and he undoubtedly can be the greatest talent in the entire history of the Cairo Kingdom. Without wasting any more time, Willis explains about the ranking process. Rank battle is divided into official and unofficial ones. In an official rank battle, strength is proven by getting permission from the Valhalla Temple and defeating opponents in front of them. 
Winning or losing in the official ranked battle sets the soldier's rank right away, and although the ranking will be announced early next year, an ID is given to prove that they are ranked. Unofficial battle is a term created due to sudden confrontations against rankers. If someone defeats a ranker in an unofficial match, the winner does not automatically join the rankings, and Roman defeats Homeros in an unofficial ranked battle which means that he will get the 100th rank if he can prove his strength. Since the Valhalla Temple only believes what they see, they cannot believe the mouths of others even if hundreds of people witness it. Therefore, Willis shows Roman the aura meter to check the qualification unofficially. It provides proof simply. If Roman meets the criteria they set for the ranker, he is ranked as someone worthy of the last rank in the rankings. Looking at Willis, Roman asks why it is so important to become a ranker. Willis can only explain that it helps one spread their name as a swordsman. Even if there are no special rewards, risking their life for the sake of honor is worth it. Roman smiles, totally familiar with the concept. He asks Willis if it will be easier if he defeats a higher ranker in an official battle than going through this complicated process. Hearing Roman's words, Willis can only be surprised at his bold statement. He explains that although it is the best way to prove his strength, however, a ranked match needs the opponent's consent, and the time must be scheduled. And with the fact that Cairo lacks any rankers, finding an opponent is close to impossible. After Roman understands his explanation, Willis urges him to take the test through the Aura Meter. Aura Meter, contrary to the brand name, it is simple. It has the shape of a sphere and the size of a fist, and it changes color according to the mana that people infuse into it. One star is red, two star is orange, three star is yellow, and four star and above is green. Roman receives the sphere from Willis. He hasn't seen the sphere anywhere else and thinks it is interesting. Unlike Mirim, the Salamander Continent is a world where mana develops. Roman looks at the Aura Meter and is curious if mages are like sorcerers of Mirim or someone who reaches the realm of God. He can't understand it, yet he also feels curious. Considering that there is a tool to measure even the power of someone, he knows magic cannot be overlooked. Roman begins to wonder how the Aura Meter will react if he releases Aura in the way the Aura Swordsmen of this world did. For once, he judges it is okay to follow the way of this world. Roman grabs the Aura Meter and begins to infuse his mana into it. When Roman infuses his mana, the Aura Meter responds immediately. It causes vibration. The currently grayish Aura Meter quickly changes colors, starting with red and progressing to orange. Yet, the process doesn't stop, and the color change is quick and smooth. According to what is generally known, the measurement time of an Aura Meter is usually around 5 minutes, but for Roman, it takes less time. The meter turns yellow soon enough. It is so swift. In just five seconds, the aura meter has already touched yellow. Willis is stunned. What he is witnessing means Roman is clearly a three-star aura swordsman. After confirming that the aura meter is safe, Roman goes straight to the point. Aura explosion is based on the way this world cultivates it. And now Roman has changed it to the method of Murum. When he lets out quite a bit of mana at once, the aura meter reacts as if it would explode at any moment. Grinning happily, Roman keeps infusing his mana until a roar can be heard from the aura meter. The color, which dyes the aura meter yellow, soon changes to green and becomes a shade of darker green. Then, all of a sudden, the aura meter cracks. Watching the cracks on its surface, Willis only stands there, dumbfounded. Aura meter never shows any other color apart from those mentioned, red, orange, yellow, and green. It is also said that the aura meter never breaks during an aura evaluation. Even when a six-star aura swordsman infuses his mana, it only shines green, and there is no abnormality with the aura meter. Then, out of nowhere, Roman asks if the aura meter is defective. Willis stutters when he can't give any clear answer, but before the aura meter breaks, it definitely shines green. He is confident in his sight, so Willis is sure of one thing. Roman Dimitri is a four-star aura swordsman. Roman Dimitri isn't a sleeping dragon but a monster that takes the form of an adult. Being a three-star can be considered one of the most incredible things for someone of Roman age. This means that the possibilities for Roman in the future are endless. He is easily a talent who can aim for five-star and higher. Willis is sure his talent will eventually cause a mess in the entire continent. Eventually, Willis decides that he has to look into what happens and tell him the results within a few days. As he expects, he needs to study Roman thoroughly. A few days later, as Willis sits in front of a stack of papers, he notices Roman has lived a not-so-special life until recently. He is nothing more than an ordinary noble family's trash, and his people think of him as a fool. However, his reputation changes starting from his incident with the Blood Fang. On top of that, he intervenes in the war between Barco and Lawrence and defeats Homeros as well. So, he decides to check the results of the Aura Meter and then makes the final decision. The fact that it breaks down can only mean that an intangible force is applied to it, which the Aura Meter can't handle. Also, the result of Shining Green is expected. Roman is a four-star Aura Swordsman. Now, Willis is sure that he has to report it immediately to Valhalla Empire and raise Roman status to recruitment target. 
Valhalla isn't just a barbarian nation that is all about fighting. They know how to act clever enough to build the status of an empire and even devise a way to use the tradition of the ranking system to bring out the talents of the other nations into their own. Actually, it becomes straightforward to do so because most people consider the ranking to be an honorable position. Willis reveals his reasons for coming and explains what he knows about Roman. One of the priests of the empire tells him to raise Roman's rank and find a way to recruit him for Valhalla. However, people do not know that they're trying to snatch the talents of other nations under the name of a ranking system. So, he advises Willis to bring Roman to Valhalla as naturally as possible. Willis understands his assignment, and tomorrow, he will inform Roman that the aura meter's readings are incorrect, and Roman is announced a 3-star instead of a 4-star. Roman also takes the last place in the rankings, and Willis is sure that such a title in a small nation like Cairo is enough to cause an uproar. The next day, the entire Cairo kingdom is shocked by Willis' announcement, and Roman is titled as the youngest ranker. The capital of Cairo is also in shock after receiving the news, and Marquess Benedict confirms the news to his assistant, and the rumors seem to be true. As a three-star or a swordsman in the present, he realizes that Roman has an outstanding prospect in the future. As Marquis Benedict, he can't help but want to covet it. In particular, his desire for a competent swordsman is big. As the rumors say, if Roman has the talent, Benedict must take him into his household. But then he receives the news that other empires have already approached Roman. Marquis Benedict curses them for trying to take a talent born in Cairo. As of now, the Cairo kingdom is divided into four factions. There is the royal family that follows the king, the nobles centered on the king's uncle, Marquis Benedict, and the pro-Chronos and pro-Valhalla forces, who are born in Cairo but attached to foreign powers. That is the reality of the tiny nation of Cairo. Even though there are forces that openly support the empires, Cairo has no particular way to sanction them. Then, Marquis Benedict tells his assistant to send someone over to Dimitri because Roman should never get into anyone else's hands, especially the royal family. Meanwhile, in the western front of Cairo Kingdom, the ensuing battle leaves a trail of corpses and blood all around the fortifications Cairo has built. The Kronos Empire borders the Cairo Kingdom to the west and the Hector Kingdom to the south. Although there was not much confrontation with the Hector Kingdom, the Kronos Empire demanded that the Cairo Kingdom become a vassal of the Empire, and even tried to attack Cairo several times near the borders over the years. At the forefront, Cairo's soldiers constantly die, and the ones who follow Kronos ask Cairo to surrender from the inside. This afternoon, Rodwell and his friend are moving the corpses. Rodwell then drops a single match and sets fire to the corpses piled up like mountains in the vast plain. This is the most polite thing they can do for the dead on the front lines, where even a proper funeral can't be held. No matter how much time passes, they can't get used to their colleagues dying due to the nation being weak. Then, his friend asks if Rodwell has heard about the news that his brother Roman has been announced as a ranker. At this moment, Rodwell frowns. He also hears the rumors about Roman. The title of the youngest ranker is such a colossal achievement that even those on the front lines know it. No matter how hard he thinks, Roman is nothing more than trash in his eyes. In the end, Rodwell says that it's all just a rumor. He turns away and watches the flame burn, believing the truth will come out eventually. Back at Dimitri Estate, Roman gets an unexpected guest today. So, Roman asks everyone to leave the room, and his guest introduces himself as a servant of the royal family. And he comes to Dimitri to offer Roman a place as a royal knight of Cairo. Roman smiles, noticing that people have finally begun to move earnestly to secure Roman to their factions. And so the journey of the newly born dragon will soon begin.